and everything will be shaken. The only folks who will make it through that are those standing on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ when all of the ground around us is sinking sand. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Mark's Gospel. We're getting back into this study of the Gospel in action. An astonishing motivation for sharing the Gospel. I want you to stand with me and just, I hope you'll look in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, see me afterwards. I want to get you one. Uh, but look at this passage, chapter 7, verses 31 to 37. Then he, that is Jesus, returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee and in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue and looked up to heaven and he sighed and said to him, Ephaphtha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And then Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute to speak. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. I ask you this, I've been asking myself this this week, am I still astonished by Jesus? Am I still astonished by Jesus? Thank you. Let's be and take a look at this for a few minutes. You know, he's in this region when, where we go back to Mark chapter 5 where the demoniac was healed. And when he moves into this region, there are people now that are just, just the multitudes are pressing in on him. People are bringing the sick to him. It is, it's, it's, it is a testimony to the lasting impact. When Jesus, when Jesus makes an impact on your life, it's a lasting impact. You don't get over Jesus. You can get over religion. You can get over some kind of a spiritual experience, but you don't get over an encounter with Jesus. So it doesn't surprise us that they're bringing people who are beyond the reach of the medical world of that day. The fellow he brings to him, we're going to see, the ESV uh, says politely he has a speech impediment. That's not what this problem, man's problem was. He, he, is, he can barely speak. We think we know something associated with that. In fact, one commentator said he's almost completely mute. Let's look at this passage under, under these four considerations, if you will, with me. First, Jesus' healing ministry makes a lasting impact. We mentioned that. Second, Jesus' healing manner is somewhat remarkable. Third, Jesus' command for secrecy has just the opposite effect. And finally, the powerful motivation of astonishment. Look, first of all, at Jesus' healing ministry makes a lasting impact. He's come back to this region. Now, let me ask you something. Does that happen today? He's come back to the area where he healed the demoniac and the people are still bringing folks to him. They're, they're bringing the difficult cases to him. There are some sicknesses that have prescriptions for them in Jesus' day and, and folks follow the prescriptions and, and healing comes. But, but the medical arts of the day had no answer for a man who was deaf and a man who could barely speak. The Jewish leaders from the religious standpoint had no answer for this. They take this man to Jesus because they know others who were touched by Jesus in that same region. Some, they may even have known the demoniac. They may have known the man who was wild and, 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 and could not be kept in check. Was, was a danger to himself and a danger to others. They may even have known him. They bring this fellow to Jesus who's in desperate need. Notice in verse 32, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. They begged him. There's a word for that there, us here. Do we get desperate? You know, are we, are we polite about our needs? You know, Jesus, it would be great if you would do, or do we, have, we, have we been thrust on our faces to beg Jesus, Lord, if you don't move, there will be no advantageous, no redeeming movement here. It's a great lesson for us, and, and we, I need to repent whenever I whenever I speak calmly to God 
and perhaps consider that, that perhaps prayer is not effectual because prayer is not in earnest. It's not desperate. Desperate praying. Do we, so I just I read that and I have to ask myself, does my life reflect a lasting impact? Can people be around me and have a sense that I've had a, I've had a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ? I hope not. I, and I hope it has nothing to do with me being a reverend or a pastor or a minister. My life, not my vocation, but my life, does it reflect a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ? Secondly, I want us to see this. The, the healing manner, somewhat remarkable. We're told he, he took the man aside from the crowd. This is Jesus never healed to impress anybody. He didn't heal. You know, I think about these so-called healers going around today and they, and they get the people up on the stage and most of the people Jesus healed could never have made it to the stage except the guy that was carried by his friends, all right? And they get up on the stage and they say, now tell us what you need. And they put the microphone in their faces and so all oh, everyone can see. And, and then they've something happens, maybe healing occurs, maybe it doesn't, and all the people are astounded at the fellow who did it. Jesus' healing ministry is altogether different, and I would challenge anyone who says he or she has a healing ministry simply to follow Jesus' model and example. He takes the man aside, and probably, from what he says later, probably his friends who were with him, the, the folks who, who helped him to, to find where Jesus was, he takes them aside. He puts his fingers into his ear. Now, the, the method he's using here, the manner he uses, some have suggested that, that he wants the man to know, he wants him to connect, directly connect the healing that comes to him from Jesus' action on his behalf. So he puts his, in fact, the scripture says he thrust his fingers into his ear, to the man's ears. Then he takes uh, spittle. He touches the man's tongue with it. Spittle from his tongue to the man's tongue. That, those, those things seem offensive to us in a, in a very hygienic day, but, but there's power in the symbolism here. And we're told here that looking up to heaven, now he's done these things, he, he's acted on the man. He, he looks up to heaven and he sighs. You can, you can almost hear it, can't you? It's the, So much hurt, so much pain, so much sickness, so much sadness. Jesus is the perfect God-man, but he is not beyond the capacity of experiencing compassion fatigue. He sighs. Oh, brothers and sisters, when you sigh at life's heaviness, you're in good company. This great heaving, and then he speaks the pathta. That's the second time that Mark has given us the, the native tongue Jesus was speaking in, probably Aramaic. And then Mark tells us what it meant, be opened. Be opened. It's a command. And it's recorded that his ears were open, his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Here's a man who had, think about what it would have been like to be deaf and almost completely mute in that day and time. First of all, you had a lot of people thinking, this fella or his parents really messed up big time for him to be experiencing these difficulties. Then there's a second stigma of even being able to communicate. Someone said that at least the blind man who could speak and could hear, could hear things and talk to people. Here's a man who could not hear people, who could not respond to them, who would live a life of totally being misunderstood, totally being out of place and looked down upon. Think about the freeing, liberating effect when his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. The power. And what happens next? Jesus' command for secrecy. He tells 
verse 36, he charged them, so, we, so the man and his friends, presumably, to tell no one. Why, would, why does Jesus do this? this is, we've seen this come up over and over, and you'll see it again, and you read the other gospel accounts and you find that. It's, it's been suggested that Jesus is on his own timetable unveiling his messiahship. And he does not want people to superimpose upon him how that messiahship is going to be defined. When he feeds the multiplied thousands, they, they rush him in John's gospel. They want to make him king by force. <laughs> Here's our breadwinner. Forget welfare. This guy can serve it up out of practically nothing. He would not allow that. And so he will not allow people to define him. We've already told you early on in Mark that his purpose of doing miracles was not an end in itself to make people feel better, to bring them from their affliction. It was to give a window unto his capacity to forgive sin. Jesus wants to be revealed as Messiah when he is stretched out on a cross, beaten beyond recognition. That is his unveiling. That is his reveal. And so he, he does this, these powerful works of miracles. A heart of compassion that just moves in response to someone who is begging for help and then says, don't tell anyone. But the text says, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. His command for secrecy has just the opposite effect. In fact, I would say to you, on the surface, it looks contradictory, but it's not. Jesus desires to be proclaimed for who he is, the Savior of sinners. He let us know that. Mark records it earlier in, in, in the gospel. Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and take up your bed and walk? But I say so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say this paralytic, rise, take up your bed and walk. Because if I can do that, you ought to stop and consider that I can also forgive sins. And so he's not wanting to be wrongly defined. But they, here, here's the interesting dilemma to me. This man who couldn't hear, who now hears and speaks plainly when he encounters somebody. What has happened to you? I've never heard you speak before. What's happened to you? Well, he begins to respond. Did you just hear what I said yet? You can hear too. You can hear and speak now. What has happened to you? You can't imagine a fellow saying, well, I'd rather not talk about it. No. The most amazing thing has happened to me. Jesus. The one they call Rabbi. Some call him the Messiah. We went to him and, and, and my friends and my family represented me and they begged for him. Oh, heal him. Rabbi, you can heal him. We know you can. He did some things to my ears and my tongue and I can hear. I can speak. The more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. It became an it was an impossibility. A virtual impossibility. So I just submit to you that Jesus puts these people on the horns of something of a dilemma. Honoring him. And trying to keep quiet. The fourth thing we see here is this. The text tells us they were astonished. They were astonished beyond measure. They were, there was no way to capture, to cap, encapsulate their astonishment. And this was their summary of Jesus. He has done all things well. <laughs> he even makes the deaf hear. And the mute, see so what they say about his condition? The mute to speak. Brothers and sisters, astonishment 
is a powerful motivation. If you saw a tornado pass by in recent days, coming near to you but leaving you unscathed, unharmed, you wouldn't keep that to yourself. You'd say, if someone mentioned tornado or the weather, you know what, what I just saw, you've got, you've got to hear what I just saw. You won't believe it. Someone said, well, how's some, some weather, isn't it? He said, yeah. No, you, you would have to tell that, that, that astonishing event. And you could put out in a, in a number of different ways. So the bottom line for me is, because see, we, just the opposite is true. Jesus commands us to speak. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So I wonder when I don't say so, when I don't initiate the continual astonish, astonishing amazement I have that Jesus would save me, have I, am, I, am I getting over that? I, I mentioned to the folks that gathered for Gene Russell's funeral, one of the things, well, many things, but one of the things about Gene was he never got over being saved. My friend and mentor, R.F. Gates, said, Bill, I pray I never wake up on the morning that I've gotten over being saved. God, take me during the night, he said. I don't want to wake up to a, to a day when I'm not amazed. My appeal to you as I, as I search my own heart is... If life, if life is worn on you and, and perhaps grace has not, and in your imagination, always stepped in for you, guard your heart against getting over being saved. If you're saved here today, think about in eternity past, God set his heart upon a people to save them. In the fullness of time, he sent his son to live and die and rise again for those people. And you, if you're saved here today, he had you on his heart and mind in eternity past. And when he sent his son to die in your place, you were on his mind at the cross. That should Stagger us. Humble us. And provoke us. I say, oh yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great thing you just told me about there. And that's wonderful for you. But I'm going to tell you about, tell you about the great thing that's happened to me. 2,000 years ago on a cross outside Jerusalem, the perfect, sinless, spotless Son of God was taken there and willingly offered Himself up. He was nailed to a cross. It was a cruel, inhuman exercise, but oh, what was happening on that cross from heaven's perspective is beautiful. Because you see, God punished Jesus for my sin. And he sent the Holy Spirit after Jesus had risen from the grave. The Father and the Son sent the Spirit to come to me in the fullness of time in my life and convince me that what happened on the cross 2,000 years ago was Jesus dying in my place and rising for my delivery from sin. That. Nothing that's ever happened in my life matches that. And I'm quite sure that nothing that will ever happen in my life since that will match that. Astonishing. Amazing. Staggering. Grace. Brothers and sisters, don't. Don't water down. Grace. 
Don't make it something that people just should expect from God. Oh no. Amazing that God would save sinners. Incredibly amazing that God would save this sinner. Let me say to you who are not yet Christ followers here. What have you ever seen in life that astonishes you at that level? You tell me. We'll match astonishing realities. Nothing. Nothing comes close to that, brothers and sisters. Nothing comes close to that, my dear friends, who have not yet committed your life to Christ. That's purpose. Just as this man's friends could say, he's done all things well. You've got to believe that. No matter what has happened in your life, all the things that have happened in your life, you've got to believe Jesus does all things well. It's an old hymn I sang to my mom when she was on her deathbed. Whatever our God ordains is right. Holy His will abides. We'll not fear whatever befalls, but follow where He guides. Jesus does all things well. And if we remember that and believe that, I think that grace will be more and more astonishing to us as we go on in the journey. And we won't give in to the devil's lies that Jesus has let us down here and Jesus has disappointed us here and Jesus didn't come through here. Oh no. Oh no. Jesus does all things well. Be astonished by the amazing grace of God shown to sinners in rescuing you from sin and death and hell and the grave. Let's pray together.